we'll have a formal 10 minutes of introduction etc and then you will uh, continue okay. and i'll uh, take over as the uh, person comparing for or hosting the uh, event today and uh, before we start to uh, tell you a little about symbiosis law school Symbiosis Law School, you're familiar with Symbiosis Law School because you were here for the IELTS conference that we held in 2017, of Nove in the November of 2017. Uh, Symbiosis Law School, Pune is a constituent of Symbiosis International University and it stands for Excellence in Legal Education. The law school was piloted and enriched by the vision of uh, Dr. Mujumdar and it was established in the year 1977 and since 2007 this law school has consistently been ranking amongst the top 10 law schools of the country. We are indeed very privileged to collaborate with IALIS and host the IALIS Distinguished Guest Speaker Program and it's indeed an honor that we have with us Honorable Justice John Hedigan a very distinguished jurist who will be speaking to the students and faculty on the reflections on a career life in law and judiciary. This topic is surely going to be of much interest to the students and it will pave a path and set goals for many. Before I introduce the speaker for the day to the audience, uh, which comprises of students and uh, the faculty and few other guests who maybe who might have joined. Uh, and before I request uh, Justice Hedigan to address the students on the topic for the day, let me introduce Professor Dr. Shashikala Gurpur, who is the director of Symbiosis Law School, Pune, and she's also the dean of the law faculty who will be giving us a brief introduction of the IALS and she will welcome formally our guests. Uh, Dr. Shashikala Gurpur is a distinguished academician and an orator, having presented more than 200 invited lectures, workshops and seminars in prestigious universities across the globe. She's had a very outstanding uh, career with a wide range of experience in teaching research and in the industry. She's more than 26 years of teaching experience, which includes her 10 years with the National Law School Bangalore, Manipur, Manipal, Institute of Communication, University College Cork, Ireland, and her teaching and research interests, they include jurisprudence, media law, international law, human rights, research methodology, feminist legal studies, biotechnology, and she has guided more than 65 or 70 master's students and about 12 PhD students. She has about 70 articles and research papers and she has co-authored books, 12 book chapters, and they're all into her credit. She's the recipient of several distinct honors, awards and recognition for her contribution in the legal education, gender sensitization and community outreach programs. Dr. Gurpur has been the member of the Law Commission of India and she's currently also a member on the Curriculum Development Committee Bar Council of India and the Academic Council of the National Judicial Academy at Bhopal. Dr. Gurpur has been instrumental and has made tremendous contribution to internationalization efforts at Symbiosis International University and especially at the law school under its banner. The internationalization efforts, they include the impressive number of international collaborations with universities across the world, students and faculty ex exchanges, international projects like the Eurasia project, the 21st century Teach Skill project, DAD and Erasmus uh, grants and membership with international bodies such as the IALS, uh, ASLI, IUCN and CAGE. In recognition of her contribution to the Indian Legal Academia, she was listed in the book 100 Legal Luminaries of India by LexisNexis. Dr. Gurpur has also been conferred with the prestigious Anvil Kittur Rani Chennama Award by the Government of Karnataka, India in the year 2018 for her work towards empowerment of women. Mm -hmm. uh, I would request Dr. Gurpur now to introduce IALS and also welcome the guest to this uh, lecture series. Thank you, Dr. Bindu, for that generous introduction and uh, welcome uh, uh, Justice Hedigan. Uh, it's uh, such a pleasure to welcome you to these brilliant lot of students who are looking forward to interacting with you. I wouldn't stand in the way for too long. 
uh, I must tell you that uh, IALS has been such a boon to us where you are also a member on the Judicial Council of IALS for uh, last few years and I've seen your rich contribution. I've seen your interaction and uh, also the unfolding of uh, judicial uh, ethics and judicial values as uh, uh, important ingredient in legal education. Uh, we have had the privilege of hosting you here, uh, Justice. And I must tell you that International Association of Law Schools uh, uh, gave us the privilege of becoming members in 2007. Fortunately, that year coincided with my joining as the dean here. And uh, our friendship has grown over the last 13 years with uh, uh, with uh, Professor Frank taking over as the president who initially was the executive president. Uh, and then uh, we have had so many novel ideas coming into the platform of IALS. Uh, one of the ideas is to look at uh, quality legal education across the world as an initiative where we are looking at uh, uh, first we saw in terms of identifying principles of ethics, knowledge and uh, skills which was the core idea of uh, Carnegie uh, report from the United States of America coming into the fold of IALS initiatives. IALS has also provided us uh, with the forum for uh, specialized uh, faculty groups uh, with which we created this collaborative international online learning in contract law, which resulted in a few student essays across four universities uh, between symbiosis students Bhutan, uh, then in Africa and also in France. So such uh, novel experiments we have done under the ages of IALS. Uh, uh, as you all are aware, dear students, that through IALS we have had the privilege of having hosted uh, one uh, scholar who is a young professor from uh, uh, Kenya recently whose uh, tenure came to an abrupt end due to the COVID. Uh, nonetheless, we have had a uh, lot of uh, ideas exchange as well as best practices exchange. Um, IALS has granted us the privilege of uh, increasing our collaboration in Ireland with Dublin uh, uh, University College Dublin. We have had uh, uh, the Galway University in our fold, aside from my own uh, old employer, Cork University. And we have also had the privilege of bringing uh, student delegations from Australia, uh, student delegations from uh, Deakin because of the linkages we have had in the IALS. Now, this idea of IALS is part of its uh, agenda this year to go virtually in engaging with quality legal education and in bringing its resources uh, through the challenge of COVID being converted into an opportunity. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had the privilege of uh, Justice Hedigan addressing a class of this magnitude, uh, having to travel eight plus hours to Pune and then uh, being here for so many days. And second thing is that this year we are going to start with European Union Legal Studies as a specialization in LLM. Now, European Union Legal Studies uh, was kick-started again with my uh, privilege of having uh, uh, a project from Ireland long ago and uh, developing this idea of EU-India law link. Uh, so I was able to use this as a platform to experiment with that. So we started the European Union Legal Studies certificate program and it became so popular. It became such a nice launch pad for uh, internal internationalization and the study abroad program for students way back in 2009. So what started with about 30 students today turned out to be a program with uh, more than 100 students and us getting a curriculum development platform with the Eurasia project. And this year we have had value added courses from European Union Legal Studies. So we have now about 28 courses. We are looking forward to developing Jamone chair uh, by our Jamone module with the help of that while rolling out this specialization group in LLM. So uh, this is how we have gone ahead and our IALS linkages have enriched our uh, European Union Legal Studies input as well. Like for example, we had a professor coming from uh, two professors coming from uh, Ireland and teaching some of the modules. We have had online uh, collaboration by Darius Whelan who was teaching one of the modules in public health law and mental health law to mention a few. 
So IALS this year in its uh, virtual enrichment of quality legal education has introduced this innovative idea of uh, judges addressing the students. We have had the debut attempt with the uh, justice uh, Richard uh, Goldstone, which was a super hit kind of input with the students. Last week I have had the town hall with the students, which revealed that they got so much of uh, wise exposure, experiential uh, uh, nuggets from uh, Justice Richard. I'm sure students that you are going to be much more enriched or equally enriched, if not equally with the uh, Justice uh, Hedigan coming in uh, to talk to you with not only the shared past between India and Ireland in terms of borrowing on the directive principles of state policy, but also in terms of Ireland's unique leadership in uh, not only creating questions for European Court of Human Rights, but also in kickstarting some of the transformation of human rights law within the European Union. So before I uh, make way for uh, Justice Hedigan, I'm delighted to uh, create this platform um, with the kind help of IALS to listen to this rich judicial uh, trajectory of uh, Justice Hedigan through the talk that is going to come. And I'm sure that he's also going to be the beacon light for many of you who have the ambition to get into judiciary or get into international legal careers. So I wish you a great journey with Sir and I, Sir, I wish you equally enriching experience with a brilliant lot of students. I must be, if not, I mean, humbly submitting before you, if not with pride for our students that our students come through an all India level selection process. Uh, for our 300 seats, we have almost 15 to 20,000 applications. So they go through a very rigorous process of selection. So the students who are in your class could be termed as top 1% of the Indian legal student, uh, law student community. Therefore, I'm sure you are going to have a very illuminating time and a challenging uh, interaction as much as inspiring, uh, energetic, youthful uh, moments. Thank you for uh, joining us in this kind of a ritual of enriching these and enlightening these young minds. Thank you very much, uh, Guru Ma'am. And uh, now let me introduce to the audience, Honorable Justice John Hedigan. Born in Dublin, he was educated at Belvedere College, Trinity College, Dublin, and King's Inn before he was uh, called to the bar in 1976 and to the inner bar in 1990. He became a bencher of the King's Inn in 2002. He was called to the King's Bar in 1986 and to the bar of New South Wales, Australia in 1993. Justice Hedigan chaired the Civil Service Disciplinary Appeals Tribunal from 1992 to 1994. He was appointed as the judge of the European Court of Human Rights in November 1989 and served until April 2007, where he was involved in many important cases. He was subsequently appointed as a judge of the High Court in 2007 and served until his elevation to the new Court of Appeal uh, on its creation in 2016. He retired from the Court of Appeal in October 2018 and he was also appointed the cha uh, appointed chair of the Irish Banking Culture Board. We look forward to hearing Justice Hedigan and over to you, sir. I'm sure it's going to be an extremely enriching experience for all of us who are here as the audience. Thank you very much and um, good morning to everyone in Pune from Dublin and good afternoon as far as your time scale is there. Um, I just have one little question first of all. Um, it, it is intended I think to show a brief extract from the webcasting of uh, a, a case. Will I? Yes. Will you yes. play that yes. at a moment when yes. I ask yes. for it, yes. when I'm going to come and yes. deal with it? OK, that's fine. Well, first of all, let me say it is I who certainly feel humble in front of such distinguished um, legal uh, academics. Um, uh, I've always said that uh, I was a practicing lawyer. I never had any pretensions to being an academic lawyer. I was just happy to pass my exams. And I'm very grateful to my teachers for having enabled me to do that. Uh, I've always been a practicing lawyer and uh, so it's uh, a humbling experience for me when I appear in front of uh, 
uh, great uh, legal academics like yourselves. And I think I remember when I visited Pune, um, I quoted from, I don't often quote from the Bible, but on this occasion I found a very interesting quotation from uh, Daniel 12.3, which is the Old Testament. They who instruct many to justice shall shine like bright stars for all eternity. So I think students, you may honour your learned professors uh, very much. They are certainly leading you towards uh, knowledge of the law and uh, that really means a true understanding of life. It's great for me to be back in Pune again, even if only virtually. I remember my visit there three, well, three, almost three years ago uh, with great fondness. Uh, we were very well uh, looked after. We had a most interesting uh, meeting. And in fact, I only last night, I found my little symbiosis law school uh, booklet, which was presented to me for, and everyone else, for making notes. No lawyer should be without one. And uh, so I have very fond memories of my time, my visit to India and Pune. Uh, as Professor Gurpur has, has pointed out, there are extraordinarily close links between Ireland and India. Uh, they go right back to the struggle that we both had against colonialism, uh, fighting the same enemy really and achieving independence in our different ways. Uh, I'm aware also that when drafting the Indian constitution, the Irish constitution was, uh, was very close and kept very closely in mind by the drafters of the Indian constitution and certain parts of it are very closely uh, following the, the Irish constitution of 1937. So there are very strong links between our two countries and I'm delighted to add just this one tiny little link uh, as well here today. So I'm to talk about uh, a career in the law, and I suppose the best place to begin is at the beginning. Uh, I was uh, born and brought up on a farm uh, just outside the uh, city of Dublin. Uh, my first uh, tasks as a kid helping out around the farm were things as simple as mucking out stables and helping to milk the cows. I remember th those little activities very fondly. Uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, attend school in Belvedere College, the same school that James Joyce went to and wrote about, uh, in fact, and uh, subsequently, uh, or at the same time, actually, once I got to my teen years, uh, I used to work in uh, my father's business uh, uh, in a small way to make money during holidays. So. Uh, I had a, a very non-legal type of background, if you if you like. Uh, when I left school in 1967, I was a bit foot loose and probably a bit ahead of myself. And I set off around the world in search of I know not what. But I spent three and a half years away and a large part of it, in fact, in Australia and wound up as the night manager of the Whale Car Wash in Bondi Junction in Sydney. I thought I was on top of the world. I was just 19 years old and I was actually in charge of something. So it was very exciting and interesting. However, I decided to go back home and I did in 1971 and I started off studying law in Trinity College, Dublin. Uh, uh, and a university founded in 1541, I think it was, uh, it was a very, very old university in any event. Uh, while I was there, I studied law and history and classical civilization, those latter two being great interests of mine throughout my life and which I still love reading. When I was in uh, Trinity College, myself and a number of other students co-founded the Trinity branch of Amnesty International. And uh, I was selected to sit on the, uh, the, the, the national executive, the Irish national executive of Amnesty International, at the time chaired by uh, Sean McBride, who was the son of one of the executed 1916 leaders. 
and who actually had the very interesting distinction of holding the Nobel Peace Prize and the Lenin Peace Prize at the same time. I don't think anybody else has ever done that. Mary Robinson, subsequently president of Ireland, was also on that executive board at the time. I got called to the bar in 1976 and just at that same time I was nominated as Amnesty International's national coordinator for the campaign against torture. Uh, as unthinkable as slavery was our uh, motto. Uh, at the bar, I practiced in a system that would be quite familiar to you. I was very sorry to hear about the passing away of uh, Mr. Ram, who was a, an advocate of outstanding abilities in Indian legal history, a veritable lion in, in, in uh, defense of justice. Uh, he addressed us at the Pune meeting and we were all very taken uh, with, uh, with him. The system in Ireland is much the same as that in England, barristers, solicitors, common law uh, system. And uh, I practiced very much in the area of administrative law, constitutional law, commercial law. You have to have a very you have to have a very wide range of abilities in a small market like Ireland, because if you specialized in one particular area, there probably wouldn't be enough to allow you to make a living. I also had a great interest in human rights and uh, really that in a way derived from my interest in international politics and particularly in American politics, uh, which was fueled by the, the election of John F. Kennedy as president, being of very near Irish extraction. Uh, he, it was a sensation in Ireland when he got elected and I remember being allowed to stay up late on the night of November the 8th, 1960 to observe his election. One of the great struggles that his administration had was the civil rights uh, area and our TV screens were full, full of film of uh, dogs, police dogs attacking uh, black Americans um, uh, who were trying to protest. So from that my interest in human rights uh, developed. There, was, there were not a lot of human rights type cases that I was involved in in Ireland because there weren't very many. Uh, we do have in our constitution a whole section devoted to fundamental rights and because of the strength of that, very few cases arose that would wind up going to Strasbourg. And the result is there are actually very few Irish cases in Strasbourg, but the ones that do go there or have gone there uh, have been very uh, significant and important cases. Um, my interest in Strasbourg anyway uh, developed uh, while I was practicing at the bar and I became aware of the uh, the the, the vast increase in the amount of cases going there. The court was founded in 1959. Its very first case, in fact, was Lawless versus Ireland, uh, which was an interesting portent of the future because so many other cases, uh, Airy, Bosphorus Air, Norris versus Ireland, became key cases in the uh, jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. But it, uh, it delivered its first judgment in Lawless in 1961. And initially the court actually met only, I think, maybe once a year for a few years. Uh, so there were very, very few cases. But then in the 1970s, things started to take off and the number of cases increased exponentially. So much so that the system that existed uh, was um, overwhelmed, really, uh, by the, the numbers involved and a reformation of the, uh, the whole system there was uh, embarked upon. And as it happened, uh, my wife was a lawyer working in our Department of Foreign Affairs and she was the agent for Ireland at the Court of Human Rights. She, that meant, organised the defence of the few cases taken against us. But it also meant that she sat in a committee that drafted uh, the protocol that was to reform the entire system. So I was getting an insider's view all the time. It was fascinating uh, as I heard the developing uh, in plans. And the result of that was that uh, I wrote about uh, the changes about to commence in Strasbourg in an article entitled Revolution in Strasbourg, which was published in the Irish Law Times in 1996, I think it was or possibly early 1997, whatever, around that time anyway. 
I suppose it was as a result of that that when the the new arrangements were finally ratified and it was decided that there was to be uh, I'm not going to go into the details of that, it's too complicated for this short talk, but uh, when it was decided that there was to be a new full-time permanent court established in Strasbourg, a court of human rights, uh, then the election process for judges to that court was commenced. Uh, more in hope than expectation, I put my name forward uh, and the system was that the government had to submit three names for consideration by the parliamentary uh, assembly of the Council of Europe, which is made up of parliamentarians from the 40, then 41 countries, now 47 of the, Euro, of the Council of Europe, which is different from the European Union, 27 countries. Uh, it is, the Council of Europe is devoted to uh, human rights and to democracy and the rule of law. And, and certain other things that flow from that. So in any event, um, I put my name forward and I wound up on the list of three and was interviewed in Paris by the uh, ad hoc committee of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and was ultimately elected a judge. Uh, and uh, it was curious in that the uh, my election, along with almost all of the other new judges, was in January 1998. But we were not actually coming into existence as a new court until November 1998. So I had this strange kind of uh, hiatus in between. And uh, in the course of that time, we had, I think, about four meetings of the court elect because we had to draft our own rules and do things like uh, organize our IT and, and so on. It was a, a fascinating time, I must say, but it also was a great opportunity to get to know a lot of my new colleagues. And it was very fortunate, I hope it's still the same, I think it is, that there was a very warm relationship built up between us all. We were all hugely excited and enthusiastic about the opportunity that was coming our way and it uh, would be greatly looked forward to it. Uh, there was 40 um, uh, judges uh, at the time in November 1998. The 41st had the post had not been filled. The Russian candidate had tragically been killed in a car crash, so they had to go back to square one and um, elect a judge. The judges are, are required to be completely independent, to uh, to uh, owe as much of a duty to all of the people of Europe, to all of the member states as to their own country. Uh, to that extent, they were always described as the judge elected in respect of Ireland rather than the Irish judge, a perhaps slightly clumsy way of expressing the fact that they sat in their individual capacity. But the challenge, of course, was an enormous one. Uh, one court for 850 million people. For Indians who are used to huge statistics, they, these things may sound sort of uh, run of the mill, but for Europeans and certainly for Irish people, these are staggering uh, figures. Also, it was one single court. Could it possibly work? I suppose the attitude we took was to do the best that we could. And that is what we proceeded to do. Uh, big backlogs built up. I will maybe, if there's some time at the end, refer very briefly to boring statistics, but which are pretty jaw dropping. Uh, but nonetheless, we did what we could, which was the only approach that we possibly could take. But where did the court come from? Where is this whole idea of international supervision deriving from? A lot of uh, criticism uh, that this court is something of an interfering busybody has of, co of course come from countries who are subjected to a judgment that is embarrassing politically and, and socially as well. Uh, even individuals such as the famous Justice Scalia of the United States asked the question, who the heck do they think they are? Well, of course, the whole origin and thinking behind the U European Court of Human Rights is that human rights cannot be protected properly at national level. 
uh, the history of Europe throughout the 20s and the 30s with the development of communism, authoritarian communism and fascism showed that in fact the real enemy of people's rights were their own governments as they subverted the, the rights of people. And ultimately the conclusion was reached that you had to have some form of international supervision where governments, countries, member states would supervise each other. And that in fact was the original idea. Although individual petition became the main uh, uh, type of case before the court, the original intention was that it should be states would supervise states and bring cases against them. Uh, this, as the convention was being conceived, this was uh, accentuated by the development of, of apartheid in South Africa, which again showed that the real enemy of the people and their rights was the national government. So it's from that uh, thinking that the um, European Court of Human Rights uh, emerged. International supervision, whereby countries judge each other. So when certain countries say, well, who the heck do they think they are? They're interfering in our domestic affairs. It is a bizarre sort of comment to make because the European Court of Human Rights doesn't have any other role. That is its role, to interfere in the internal affairs of individual countries, because it's told to do that by those very same countries themselves. So how does the court do its business? I have to give a bit of a health warning here because it's 13 years since I left Strasbourg and I try hard to keep up, but it's very difficult because there is so much going on there. Um, so there's a slight health warning and your professors may well be able to correct me on some things if I'm incorrect uh, in subsequent uh, lectures. There are original applications which may be made literally by just a letter sent by an ordinary person saying that uh, their country has done something which violates their rights under the convention and uh, and uh, that, that they are, they have suffered damage as a result thereof. That will be taken on board by the registry staff and will be processed through a system that provides for single judges, <coughs> three judge committees, chambers of five chambers of seven judges and one grand chamber of 17 judges. The single judge committee uh, deals with cases that are clearly and obviously not appropriate for the Court of Human Rights for all sorts of different reasons, perhaps because they arise out of events occurring long before a particular country joined the Council of Europe or where, for instance, some people try to sue the United States of America before the European Court of Human Rights, an impossibility. They're not parties to the Convention. Uh, so very simple and clear cases that are going nowhere are dealt with by single judge committees and those in fact have dealt with enormous numbers. 33,288 were declared, uh, applications were declared inadmissible by single judge committees in the year 2019. So that's a very good way of dealing with the vast number of applications that come in. The three judge committees uh, may also find cases inadmissible or they may find violations in relation to cases where there is the, 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 juristic, uh, the jurisprudence is well established and there is no need for the case to go any further or receive any further consideration. However, the cases that do raise uh, real issues of concern uh, legally and otherwise are, will be sent to chambers of seven judges. There are five of these and there they will be dealt with quite frequently, not without a public hearing. There aren't all that many public hearings in the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, the cases may be brought before the, uh, the, the, the the, the uh, chamber of seven and in many cases may be disposed of relatively quickly with a judge rapporteur outlining the case to his or her colleagues discussion taking place a decision being made uh, the matter being adjourned to a, a, a panel that will draft the judgment in in association with the registry and then subsequently brought back and agreed as a judgment so what are some of the uh, 
By the way, could I ask uh, whoever is in charge to please let me know when 25 minutes have passed? Uh, I don't want to uh, mess up the time schedule here. I won't take offence, I promise. Uh, and I'll finish up then because I can really bail out almost any time I, I, I need. Um, but uh, just a few of the issues that regularly arise uh, in cases and that cause them to be decided one way or the other. The obligation to exhaust domestic remedies is one of the key uh, matters. And this is because every member state is entitled to resolve the convention issue in its own legal system before a person refers it for international supervision. And uh, that is a <clears throat> that can be at times a very controversial uh, matter. Uh, one of the early cases that I was involved in as judge rapporteur was the interstate case of Cyprus versus Turkey. And that was a case where uh, Turkey had invaded Cyprus and set up the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. The Greek Cypriots who lived there, of course, bitterly resented this and uh, did not want to recognize the state in any way at all. But the convention requires that there be no human rights vacuum. So Turkey, a member of the Council of Europe, was obliged to ensure that courts that could deal with people's uh, complaints and provide effective remedies should exist. But of course, they didn't want to, the, the Turkey, uh, the Greek Cypriots in the so-called TRNC didn't want to do this. It was uh, highly offensive to them. Our court in Cyprus versus Turkey in a very controversial decision found that they had to do that. And the reason for that was based firstly upon the Namibia opinion of 1971 of the International Court of Justice, uh, which dealt with a situation where there was de facto illegal, de facto regimes such as that of South Africa in Namibia. Their UN uh, uh, right to run the place had been withdrawn. But the Namibia opinion of the ICJ observed that, of course, if this happens, that human life still goes on. There have to be births, deaths, marriages registered, contracts have to be honoured. Otherwise, the oppressed people are even more oppressed. So there has to be some measure of recognition of the acts of so-called de facto regimes. And in that context, we took the view, it was the decision of the court, that the even the, uh, the, the Greek Cypriots in the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus had to exhaust the remedies in the courts that had been established. Another reason for the court's decision was that it would be entirely anomalous if the, the convention requiring it's a country such as Turkey to establish in the TRNC courts that provided protection for human rights were then not obliged or were, were not able to actually operate them uh, because people wouldn't go there. It would also turn the court in Strasbourg into a court of first instance. So that was the obligation to exhaust domestic remedies. Uh, the court couldn't be a first instance court, but it also can't be a fourth instance court, by which I mean that it is the procedure and effects in that procedure that must be examined by the court and found to offend against the convention rather than the court focusing on the outcome of the case itself. Another element of the uh, of the court regularly uh, 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 arising is that of the margin of appreciation. This is a very difficult and complex area and I tried for the purposes of this uh, lecture, I tried to sum it up as simply as I could as follows. Where independent and impartial domestic courts have analyzed in a comprehensive and convincing manner the contested legal measure on the basis of the relevant human rights standards and provides relevant and sufficient reasons for their decisions, the court will rarely intervene. This uh, is strongly connected, this margin of appreciation, to the concept of the subsidiarity principle, which is that human rights like charity begin at home. And it is in the domestic courts that the convention should develop and should be given effect in the ideal world, which will never exist. Strasbourg wouldn't need to exist. The human rights convention would be implemented nationally. 
of course, that's never going to happen. Uh, and there will be always a need for the court in Strasbourg to be the final authoritative voice. Uh, but what it does provide is a very interesting um, view in terms of the, uh, the, the, the development of the convention, because what it really emphasizes is that it is a code of minimum standards and that in fact the individual countries can go as far beyond the, the, the general view of uh, the law as they wish in implementing and interpreting the convention. Of course, it only binds themselves. Uh, but the idea is that what is really aimed for is an inconsistency of rising standards, but all countries must comply with the minimum standard. So in addition to judging, what was my role uh, as a, a judge in the court? Uh, I became quite involved from the very beginning in the actual administration of things. As I said, I have no pretensions to academic uh, qualifications. And in fact, when I went to Strasbourg, I was well aware of the fact that there were a great many very distinguished professors there. And I have to confess, I was a little nervous about how I would get on with them. But in fact, they became my best friends on the court. And uh, we learned an awful lot from each other. I think I learned a heck of a lot more than, from them than they did from me. But nonetheless, I learned a great deal. And in fact, um, sad to say that uh, the then president of the court, who became probably my best friend on the court, uh, President Lutzis Wildhaber, only died a few days ago. I was very sorry to see that. A wonderful gentleman, a fine lawyer, uh, a former rector of Basel University. One of his predecessors was Erasmus. Uh, so his loss is a sad loss to the world of the law and of human rights. But anyway, uh, I wound up getting involved in a lot of the administration of the court. Uh, I chaired the Committee on the Status and Conditions of Judges. I chaired the, in the, uh, the IT Committee and also the Language Training Committee. It's a bilingual court. And for most of the judges, they have to operate in two foreign languages. Only the Francophones and the Anglophones have the luxury of operating in one uh, national language, their own and one foreign language. So much less pressure on us than there was on the other. At one stage near the end, I had 30 judges studying English or French at different levels. And I greatly admired their commitment to the cause by going back to learning a language again, which was not easy for them. I was also a member of the Library Committee and the Rules Committee. What was it like? Well, it was a marvellous opportunity. As I said at the outset, we all found it tremendously exciting uh, to be involved in such a great endeavour and such an historic one. And I treasure the nine years I spent on the court in uh, Strasbourg uh, as being, I think, probably the highlight of my career. There was a great atmosphere in the court. It was a fine place to work and you, you were obliged to reside at the seat of the court. Uh, that's Strasbourg and Strasbourg turned out to be one of the most beautiful cities in Europe, if not indeed in the world, dating from Roman times when it was called Argenturatum. There were so many extraordinary stories that arose out of our study of the legal systems and cultures of what turned out to be 47 countries uh, in the end. At this stage, I'm going to mention the webcasting project because it was an Irish project from pretty much the start. I'll explain what I mean by that in a few moments. So perhaps this would be a good opportunity to play the piece that you've chosen. Uh, it gives, it gives people a sense, a feel of just what the court is like, what it's like to be there. Uh, Zia, uh, Zia, could you play the video? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yeah, please, please.
There doesn't appear to be any sound. Volume. The applications were allocated to a section of the court pursuant to Rule 52, Paragraph 1 of the Rules of Court. These applications were respectively communicated and re-communicated to the government on 4 March 2008. On 19 May 2009, the Chamber decided to relinquish jurisdiction in favor of the Grand Chamber, none of the parties having objected. The Turkish government are represented by their agent, Mr. Nekatigil, assisted by Sir Michael Wood, counsel, and Mr. Talmon, Mr. Karbakak, Mr. Uras, Mr. Ezener, Madame Akshay, Ms. Akhuzlu Eilange, Ms. Akpak, and Mr. Furlong, advisors. The applicants are represented by Mr. David Anderson, QC, Mr. Dimitridis, Mr. Marquides, Mr. Clerides, Ms. Vokido Yazidis, Mr. Neocleus, counsel, assisted by Ms. Logisides, Mr. Paraskeva, Mr. Poliviu, Mr. Arakelian, Mr. Angelidis, Mr. Yazidis, and Mr. Leach, advisors. The intervening government, the Republic of Cyprus, are represented by their agent, Mr. Clerides, assisted by Lord Lester of Fernhill, QC, Mr. Lowe, QC, Mr. Saini, QC, Mr. Richards and Ms. Ioannidis, Council. I welcome the applicants and the representatives of the parties in the name of the court. I would also like to welcome several delegations of judges visiting the court today, from the African Court of Human and People's Rights, from the French Conseil d'État, from the French Judiciary, as well as from the Russian Federation and Bosnia as a governor. Having consulted the agent of the government and the representatives of the applicants, I have determined the order of addresses as follows. Sir Michael Wood for the Turkish government will speak first, and then Mr. Anderson and Mr. Dimitriadis for the applicants, followed by Mr. Lou and Mr. Saini for the in intervening government of the Republic of Cyprus. I would explain that in addition to interpreting in the two official languages of the court, English and French, interpreting into Bosnian has been authorized for the benefit of a group of judges from Bosnia and Herzegovina. We are on a study visit to the court. Such interpreting is not arranged by the court and no transcription of the oral translation will be included in the official record, record of the proceedings. I call Sir Michael Wood. Sir Michael, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Can we hear a little bit of this gentleman's submission to the court uh, just for a few moments? I don't want to use up too much time, but uh, as I think I pointed out, the, the, the British judges, the British barristers invariably were the best. That's why you could see the very odd thing that the Turkish government actually briefed a British barrister to appear. The Irish hardly ever get there, and I'm sure the Indians would have been just as good because you have professional advocates, but most advocacy in the court is of a very poor standard, whereas the British are the best. Uh, and. Uh, so it's worth listening to them if just for a few moments. Zia, you can you continue with the video, please? Okay. Jo apne khola you play it, please. And to do so on behalf of Turkey. Mr. President, in its decision in Zanidis Arrestis, the court asked Turkey to establish a domestic remedy for all property claims in Northern Cyprus. 
It identified five changes that were needed in existing law. First, to introduce the possibility of restitution of immovable property. Second, the possibility of redress for loss of movable property. Third, an international element in the composition of the Immovable Property Commission. I shall refer to the Commission in future as the IPC. Fourth, damages for non-pecuniary loss. And fifth, that the law should apply retrospectively. Turkey complied fully with the court's request by adopting law number 67 of 2005. The court then noted in its December 2006 judgment that the new law in principle satisfied all these requirements. At the same time, however, the Greek Cypriot authorities have consistently sought to disrupt the operation of this remedy, which they persist in describing as illegal. A central fact in the eight applications before you today is that not one of the applicants has taken any step to exhaust the available domestic remedies. They have all declined to do so, notwithstanding the findings of this court in the Zanidis Arrestis pilot proceedings. As you will recall, the judgment on the merits uh, in that case, in that judgment, the court suspended consideration of all applications deriving from the same general court including the eight before you today. Then, in its just satisfaction judgment, the court held, and I quote, that the new compensation and restitution mechanism in principle has taken care of the requirements of the decision of the court on admissibility and the judgment on the merits. I need hardly stress, Mr. President, that the present proceedings are important, not just for the eight applications, but for all applications deriving from the same general cause. There are, we understand, about 1,475 pending applications, and there could well be more to come in the future. Many involve more than one applicant. In an attempt to justify their passive stance, the you could, applicants you could put this briefly. as soon as you want, uh, in order First, to time for the, to finish and for questions and answers. Okay. So, uh, am I back live again for continuing this talk? Yes. Please. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, it's that, that's a very interesting choice of uh, case because it is a follow on to the Cyprus versus Turkey case that I referred to earlier. And you can see again here arises the issue of the obligation to exhaust domestic uh, remedies, uh, which is so significant. Uh, it's very interesting for me to see the judges walking out there because uh, it's 2009. It's only two years after I left and I, I recognize them all. They're all now retired from the court because their terms of office are up. Uh, the two judges sitting at the front there were the president of the court, Jean-Paul Costa from France, and Christos Rosakis, the vice president of the court, two great lawyers and very, very good friends of mine. The reason that I thought it would be nice for you to see something of the webcasting project uh, that uh, and to see a case being shown there is because it became probably the signature uh, project of the uh, the IT working group that I chaired. Uh, when I was asked at the beginning of 1998 to chair this body, there was one issue that we were really concerned with, and that was ensuring that we got our own IT system. And we had to fight hard for that uh, administratively because the Council of Europe system, we did not think was good enough for the huge task that lay ahead, and we were fortunately able to achieve that. Uh, the second project that emerged uh, was, uh, I remember that the head of IT, uh, who happened to be an, a man from Northern Ireland called John Hunter, he raised the possibility of broadcasting on the internet the public hearings of the court. Myself and my colleague, Hannah-Sophie Greve, the judge from Norway, 
were very excited by that prospect. We thought that was a marvelous uh, idea. Uh, the we had in our head the idea of ordinary folk in the middle of the steppes of Russia being able to go to a library nearby and to see on some internet connection their government being called to account before an international tribunal and not just Russia but many many countries uh, because the overwhelming majority of people, people could never get to Strasbourg. So anyway this project took a very very long time. We had first to convince the judges who were all suffering from a kind of post OJ Simpson uh, syndrome, uh, horrified at what turned out to be, as they called it frequently, a circus. And they didn't want anything like that to occur. But gradually we we worked hard on this project. We even went to uh, The Hague to see the ICTY in operation and how they did their system. And not long before uh, I left, we managed to persuade the judges uh, to try out a pilot project in which we would uh, broadcast the public hearings of the court. Uh, a key element of that that we were very conscious of from our visit to the ICTY was security. Um, the mention of the names of witnesses who could potentially disappear uh, was something very important. So one of the rules was that the first question really that uh, a, a deliberation body should ask itself after a hearing that had been videoed was, is there anything in that video uh, that should not be broadcast publicly? And if there is, delete it. So morning hearings were only available in the afternoon for security purposes. Uh, we finally had the pilot project and it was hugely impressive. I think the judges who were reluctant but gave the pilot project a go all came around to the view that this was a great idea. And one of the reasons I wanted to mention it here, to, well, one of the number of reasons I wanted to mention it here today was because my colleague from Germany, Professor Georg Ress, who was a teacher of outstanding um, uh, experience, he said to me after we'd done the first trial project of a uh, hearing, he said to me, that could be one of the great teaching tools of the world. And uh, I, I hope that uh, it may be of use uh, for students themselves. You can simply just Google webcasting and a court of human rights and up will pop the most recent case and you can get a look at uh, what is actually going on. Students might be interested to note that the QC who spoke there was speaking slowly and clearly because he is bearing in mind that he's speaking to people, most of whom, for most of whom, English is not their first language. And uh, we sometimes got advocates who spoke so fast that no one could follow what they were saying. And uh, even people who are extremely good at the language. So very good advice for, um, for uh, those who may wind up as uh, advocates. Uh, clarity and uh, pitching to the your voice to the uh, the audience that you are actually uh, addressing. The webcasting project became somewhat controversial, of course, with countries who were not very happy with the idea that they might be shown in their home countries being held to account before uh, before an international tribunal. And at the very last minute, there was an attempt made to torpedo this project on the usual grounds that this would be far too expensive and money was always in short supply in Strasbourg. Fortunately, this had been foreseen and I had got the agreement of the Irish government that they would fund entirely the installation of the webcasting system. That means the studios, the cameras, everything. And uh, they did that and they have paid for the annual maintenance of the webcasting system every year since, including to their great credit, I think, uh, during the terrible years of the economic crash that befell us from about 2009, 10 onwards. And that continues today. And in honour of their commitment and engagement, I insisted that there is a little logo at the bottom which says the webcasting project is financed by Ireland Aid uh, and uh, I'm delighted that they get the credit for that. The webcasting uh, system gets, I've forgotten exactly how many million hits a year, but it is absolutely colossal. So that was a great success 
And as I said, I'm very proud to say that it was an Irish project from end to finish. John Hunter uh, being the man who, uh, who suggested it at the very beginning and the Irish government being the ones who financed it at the very end. Anyway, I, want, I don't want to go on too long because I want to leave time for the questions and answers, but I just thought I'd bring you up to date with what exactly is at the state of play at the present moment in terms of development? Well, the president, the new president of the Court of Human Rights, Judge Sicilianos, in his opening of the year 2020, uh, described the uh, application in the case of Mamadov versus Azerbaijan, in which a judgment was delivered on the 29th of May 2019 as probably the most significant event in the court of 2019. And this was the implementation of a part of protocol number 16 to the convention, which provides for infringement proceedings to be brought against countries against whom a judgment was given and whom the committee of ministers uh, felt had not implemented it. And where the government, in this case, Azerbaijan, was disputing that and saying we have implemented it and a sort of impasse was reached, uh, the, uh, the the, uh, the enforcement procedure uh, was uh, brought about, the infringement procedure was brought about with the aim of addressing that gap. That was being talked about when I was there and uh, it was somewhat controversial because the case law of the court is so colossal that it, it has grave difficulties in, uh, in actually being able to deal with its caseload. So any extra work would be likely to be detrimental to the real job of the court, which is to hear the cases of individuals and decide them. Along with the uh, infringement uh, procedure in Protocol 16 was also an issue that was discussed a lot while I was there, and that is the court giving advisory opinions to, uh, to courts, to the top court in a particular country when it was faced with a convention issue and uh, much like the reference to the EU. Again, the argument against that was overloading the court with different functions makes it difficult for it to do its main job. It's a very difficult balancing act to know uh, where, it, where the right thing to do actually lies, but one does the best one can. Uh, protocol number 15 uh, was, has not yet come into uh, effect. Uh, it's a, a protocol that uh, was thought, as with 16, to complete the so-called interlaken process of trying to uh, bring up to date, to improve in every possible way, the working of the court. Protocol 15 introduced a reference to the principle of subsidiarity and the doctrine of margin of appreciation into the preamble of the convention, more to just indicate how important it is. Uh, it shortened, it proposes to shorten to four months the time limit for making an application. It amends the significant disadvantage admissibility uh, criterion by removing the condition that the case, that no case may be rejected on this ground, which has not been duly considered by a domestic tribunal. It removes the party's right to, reject, to object to the relinquishment of jurisdiction by the chamber, to the grand chamber, and it replaces uh, certain provisions regarding the age limit that you don't need, you need to worry about. Uh, more up to date is that um, the latest interstate uh, case uh, that exists has just been lo uh, lodged uh, with the European Court of Human Rights by the Netherlands against Russia concerning the, the downing of Malaysia Airlines flight MH17. Uh, the, uh, the, the, reg the application was registered uh, in as 28525 stroke 20, and it concerns the shooting down of the plane over the eastern Ukraine of, on the 17th of July 2014, killing 298 persons, including 196 Dutch nationals. According to the government of the Netherlands, the plane was shot down by a, a, a missile, surface-to-air missile, which belonged to and was provided by the Russian Federation. So it'll be interesting to see how that uh, case develops. Uh, to finish up, just a reference to boring statistics, because for us they are, as I said, jaw-dropping. Uh, in 2019, there were 59,800 pending applications. There were 328 judgments delivered by chambers. 
those were 545 judgments delivered by committees of three judges, 33,288 applications declared inadmissible or struck out by single judge uh, uh, formations. Uh, there were 5,002 applications declared inadmissible or struck out by committees of three. There were 11 oral hearings held by the Grand Chamber. 11 judgments delivered by the Grand Chamber, five cases were relinquished to the Grand Chamber, eight were referred to the Grand Chamber, 190 applications were declared inadmissible or struck out by Chambers. There were two advisory opinion requests and there was one advisory opinion uh, delivered. So there it is, that's the, my take on the European Court of Human Rights, uh, where I came from, how I got to my initial experience there. Uh, it's been the experience of my professional life. Uh, I am delighted to have had the opportunity to do it. I have not mentioned one of the key elements to, I think, the success of the Court of Human Rights, and that is the registry, that is the permanent lawyers who work there and who do outstanding work. Uh, I always was lost in admiration for their work ethic and for the quality of the work that they did. They draft the judgments and the drafts are then dealt with by committees of judges who determine whether or not that expresses exactly what they want. The reason for that is because except for the the Anglophones and the Francophones, everyone would be drafting judgments in a language other than their own, and that would be very difficult. Uh, it makes, I think, the judgments of the Court of Human Rights very easy to read because they all follow a very similar pattern and they all have a very high level of quality about them. So I hope that's been of interest to you. Um, thank you very much for your uh, attention and I'd be delighted to answer any questions, but just no, no hard ones, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Justice uh, Hedigan, for this wonderful uh, talk. I'm sure the audience is waiting to ask questions. And now I'll invite Professor Raj to moderate the question answer session. Hello, sir. So the first question is, what effect does Brexit have on the human rights obligations of the UK? Well, it doesn't have any uh, implications at the present moment because uh, despite what you would read in the British newspapers, which continually complain about interference by European courts, uh, and they are almost always referring to decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, which have outraged many in the House of Commons, uh, it, the court, they, they are not actually departing from the Council of Europe. Uh, and they've said they're not departing from it. They're departing from the European Union. And uh, so it's a completely different body. The European Union, as you know, is 20, now 27 uh, countries and uh, the, the Council of Europe is uh, 47. The only country in Europe that is not part of it is uh, Belarus. Uh, I must say in passing, I'm hugely saddened by the decision of the British to leave. I worked closely uh, with my British colleagues on the court, both in the registry and my British colleague, uh, Judge Bratza, who became the president of the court. And when I came back to Ireland, I wound up representing Ireland on the uh, European Network of Councils of the Judiciary. And, and I was elected to the executive board of that body. And I worked very closely there with British colleagues. They were invariably outstanding uh, contributors to everything. The British were able to provide huge backup in terms of uh, uh, reports and things like that. I don't know what we'll do without them. Uh, I think that their decision was based on an almost universal failure to understand the enormous power they wielded as uh, members of effectively the group of three themselves, France and Germany, who ran the European Union and uh, the the power that they exercised there over the most important trading body since the hist in the history of the world. I think gave them more power than they had since the height of the British Empire at the end of the 19th century. Uh, to hear the, the UK described as a vassal state by the Brexiteers was positively laughable to those who were familiar with what actually was going on in Europe. But there it is, the decision has been made, but the answer to your question is no impact whatever. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. So the next question is, can the housing crisis in Ireland be argued as a human rights issue? Uh, the 
There have been cases that uh, raised that sort of issue between be before the court in Strasbourg. Uh, nobody, to the best of my knowledge, has brought a case a against um, Ireland. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, we have in our 1937 constitution a very powerful uh, section dealing with fundamental rights and uh, nearly all the kind of issues that arise in the Strasbourg court uh, are actually capable of being dealt with and are dealt with by the domestic courts. The cases that went to Strasbourg to a great extent were ones that that are not dealt with properly in Ireland, ones relating to uh, to abortion, to contraception, to information concerning abortion and contraception and other issues, so-called social issues, which we until quite recently found very difficult to deal with, but that has changed. Housing rights, I have heard people suggest that it should be, there should be a constitutional right to, to housing. Of course, it's a very difficult social issue because you're directing the government as to how it spends its money. But well, one can see the argument for it. Uh, I think that there must be, and I think there probably is a sense in Irish people now that there is a, a constitutional right and that based on the human right to uh, to to housing. And uh, it's been it was probably the dominant factor in the last general election and resulted in the governing party, which had been considered to have done a splendid job on uh, the Brexit. Um, uh, it, it, problems and the Brexit negotiations, resulting in effectively the whole agenda for the uh, uh, the border with Ireland and the the its impact on the the single European market being written in Dublin. Uh, despite their having been perceived by everyone to have done a splendid job, they were very soundly defeated and almost exclusively on the issue of housing. So it's a very hot topic. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So the next question is, can the ECHR adjudicate, adjudicate on human rights violations committed by European countries in non-European territories? Extraterritorial yes. jurisdiction yes. of some kind. Uh, the, the court has held that the, the, the uh, countries uh, that, that um, have, for instance, uh, British troops in Iraq, uh, do have uh, responsibility for uh, their actions in terms of uh, the Human Rights uh, Convention and that they carry it to areas that they control. Uh, so uh, yes is the answer to that question. There can be uh, uh, violations of the convention occurring in areas outside the, the territory of the state, but essentially only where they are in control of, uh, of that. And a very peculiar example of that, if that's the right word to use, was a case brought against the um, the NATO states in relation to the bombing of uh, the TV tower in uh, in um, in, is it, uh, in Serbia and uh, during the, the, the that war and um, there the, the the claim was that the the, the the NATO countries were in effect in control of the uh, super incumbent column of airspace, as we used to call it in torts, over the city, the capital uh, city uh, of Sarajevo at the time, and uh, that therefore they, the, the, the people who had been uh, victimized, the relations of uh, people killed, could bring a case against the NATO countries, but the court held that that was not so. Uh, because they, they were not in control of the, the space. They were not in control of it in such a way as to impose upon them an obligation and the ability to uh, protect human rights. Uh, dropping bombs on people from high in the air doesn't actually give you the control over the human rights situation on the ground. But there can be extraterritorial uh, violations uh, of the convention. Right, so thank you so much. The next question is, respected sir, when you sit as a judge in a court looking at a human rights issue where one party is the oppressor and the other party is oppressed, how do you objectively pass the judgment? Does human emotion come into the picture when deciding a human rights issue? Well, I think um, judges, uh, you know, are are obliged to uh, do justice without fear or favor, affection or ill will and in accordance with the law. Uh, but hum judges, like everyone else, are human beings. 
and uh, they bring with them all their human background, where they come from. I mentioned it earlier how my earliest life I was helping milk the cows. That's quite an experience actually when you lay your head on the side of a cow and, and milk the cow and uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting kind of thing to do and things like that I think you know are part of one's background where you came from what your views are probably what your religion is if any and uh, so you, yeah you bring naturally an element of your emotions to bear but you must be very careful about how you bring your emotions to bear in a case because uh, a judge whose uh, heart is breaking and who is not complying with the law uh, is creating more trouble downstream for society in general uh, and uh, is possibly not doing uh, justice to the person in question. But suffice it to say that whenever a situation appeared in front of me and I was in charge of the judicial review list for quite a number of years in which the acts of the administrative acts of authorities would be challenged and sometimes by uh, people who really did feel oppressed. If I thought that there was a really unjust situation at work, I would do everything that I could to find, try to remedy it. And the courts are armed with very powerful weapons for doing that. And there is all sorts of ways of doing it. But one can never depart from the law that one has to remember that the judge is an unelected person and is bound by the law. Uh, sometimes in in the, one of your early questioners referred to the homeless situation. Sometimes in cases of repossession uh, where I, I would be dealing with maybe a large list of applications for summary judgment because there was no defence whatever to the application. Money had been loaned, secured on a property. It hadn't been paid back. Usually no payments have been made for years in, in Ireland. That's the way it tends to work. And, uh, there was, I know, I knew perfectly well, there was absolutely nothing that I could do. But I, on more than one occasion, asked the people who would generally not be represented by anyone to come up to the bench and to explain to me what the situation was. And I had people in tears in front of me at times, which was very distressing. But at the same time, it gave somebody to understand that a human being had actually listened to their story. So that's one of the ways that one perhaps does justice, even though you're you're not um, actually saving them from a house being repossessed. But on the other hand, you're putting an end to their misery and uh, bringing a closure to proceedings which are going in only one direction. Hard situations, though, but yeah, you can't uh, you can't divide yourself up as a human being. You are a human being full of emotions and and with your own background and feelings and, and, and philosophy. Yes, sir. So probably we'll take two more questions. We have time for two more questions. So one student asked you for your comments regarding the plans of Poland to leave Istanbul Convention and what are its ramifications? And the Council of Europe has also raised this issue. Agree. The Istanbul Convention you're referring to, is that the one concerning the protection of women? I believe so. Well, the Polish situation if I can just approach that in a general way because I'm not I, I know that there are proposals not just for that but for many other uh, matters in Poland that are the greatest concern to the uh, to the European Union and I was very closely involved in that on the European Network of Councils of the Judiciary in fact I co-chaired with DG Justice uh, that's Director of General Justice of the European Commission in Brussels a meeting with Justitia which is the Association of Polish uh, Judges and it was pretty awful to hear the uh, assaults that are the assaults that are being made upon their independence, the threats made to them personally, privately, publicly, uh, all sorts of very, very unpleasant uh, action going on. Uh, it's as a result of all that that the European Union and the Network of Councils of the Judiciary are deeply concerned about the rule of law in Poland. Uh, the uh, ability of the courts to actually review the constitutionality of things in Poland, of provisions in Poland, are very, very limited now. The pressure on judges through politically packed disciplinary committees, uh, which could take action against them, even for 
there are decisions on the basis that the decision was wrong and that that's a disciplinary matter. These are very serious developments. So Poland and Hungary are two countries that are giving the greatest cause for concern to the European Union. And the recent uh, decision to create this massive stimulus fund uh, may well wind up to be conditional on compliance with certain rule of law procedures and uh, the procedural way that that has been done has resulted in a situation where as that money is paid out it will not require unanimity on the part of the members of the Council of Europe uh, of sorry of the European Union uh, but a qualified majority uh, which is a very different thing and would result in an inability for Poland or Hungary to veto action taken against either one or the other. So there may be a chink of light coming in that direction. I certainly hope so. Thank you, sir. So the next question is uh, recently around the world, we've seen multiple instances of police brutality, which led to the Black Lives Movement matter and other such movements. So according to you, what are the kind of reforms that we can initiate on the international level to curb police brutality? Well, it, it, it has to come down to uh, police training. <clears throat> uh, from what I can see, police training in the US, for instance, where you're seeing a lot of this uh, uh, police brutality is very inadequate. Uh, it certainly is nowhere near the level of uh, training that police are given in our country, in Ireland. It doesn't last nearly as long and isn't anyway as in depth. And I suppose the gun toting masculist uh, characteristics of American, certain sections of American society uh, lend a, a lot of difficulty there. Uh, it's very sad to see what's going on in the US. Uh, I'm a great admirer of things American. I've been a student since, as I said, since 1960 of American history and politics. And uh, I'm profoundly saddened at the state that things have come to in the US, a country that's uh, almost deconstructing its uh, society. Uh, and uh, and of course, this Black Lives Matter is really the latest manifestation of what has been described as America's original sin, slavery. Uh, and uh, however, police brutality does exist in many countries around the world. Uh, when demonstrations occur, it's almost inevitably the case that there are going to be confrontations between uh, people, frequently young men on both sides and uh, tempers flare and things happen that shouldn't happen. It requires a very disciplined police force to keep control and that's always going to be very, very difficult. But um, certainly it's a topic that needs to be dealt with. Uh, police brutality was dealt with in uh, a number of cases before the European Court of Human Rights. I remember a case against France in which that gentleman you saw, Jean-Paul Costa, uh, was the French judge and um, uh, he said to me afterwards he was just so profoundly ashamed and embarrassed by the uh, the police brutality in his country and uh, he didn't realise it was as bad as it was. So institutions like the European Court of Human Rights are, are very good for bringing out these kind of uh, situations and, and have done on a number of occasions. Equally, we have rejected some cases where there have been fatalities as a result of the actions of police, where it was thought that in the agony of the moment, uh, police had used the minimum force and unfortunately it had resulted in uh, in fatality. So it, they're not always uh, open and shut. They're not always cut and dried. There sometimes are nuances. OK, sir. So I believe we have time for one final question. So the question is, does the German constitutional court's ruling against the ECB's public sector purchase program which is opposed to the ECJ's opinion on the same, have any negative impact on how the role of supranational judicial institutions such as the ECHR itself is perceived by the contracting states? It's a very interesting uh, judgment. And um, I must say we had our own problems with the German Constitutional Court. Uh, I, I was the judge on the first uh, case of Princess uh, Sophie von Hanover versus Germany, where the Germans had come to one conclusion about uh, the right of uh, public figures to a private life. 
and the court came to a different one. And I know that I didn't actually go up to the German Constitutional Court subsequently, but some of my colleagues did, and they certainly uh, got some strong criticism from the German Constitutional Court. So they have their difficulties with uh, international supervision. And of course, they're exacerbated by the fact that Germany is a federal uh, state and a federal lander. They have very, very great power. It's, it's not a unitary state at all. And uh, loads of things that happen uh, must be okayed by each one of the lander. So that's a difficulty. I found a little bit of difficulty with that judgment when, for instance, they uh, described the uh, judgment of the court in Luxembourg uh, in the case that they were dealing with as being incomprehensible. That to me is extraordinary injudicious language. It makes no sense because if you don't understand a court's judgment, uh, then you should ask them, what does it mean? Uh, the ability is there to do that. So uh, there were a lot of things that were rather disturbing about that judgment. But there has been also a lot of attempts by the German Chancellor Merkel and her government to damp down fears that it may interfere with the workings of the European Union or any other part of the, the Council of Europe. And I know that the ECB have recently uh, justified uh, one of their actions in relation to borrowings that was the key question for the German Constitutional Court. And um, they may well go down that road of making doing more justification for what they're doing and uh, that would uh, perhaps meet the, uh, the, the the fears of the German Constitutional Court that the European Central Bank was uh, going beyond its jurisdiction. But uh, I think you'd have to watch that space. But uh, the German Constitutional Court certainly has some very, very strong views and um, it's very interesting that uh, it's made up of a lot of professors of law as well as practicing lawyers and uh, I often wonder sometimes, you know, you have professors versus the practicing lawyers and the two bang their heads against each other and one is saying you can't do that, that doesn't work on the ground and the other says you must do that because it's not logical to do otherwise. So those are very interesting dichotomies that uh, require resolving and I greatly enjoyed those when they occurred <laughs> in the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Thank you. Uh, I think we've uh, we've had to uh, bring the question and answer session uh, to an end. Uh, I think I wanted this talk to go on and I didn't want to uh, put an end or to, uh, to to bring the flow of questions to an end because I could see the interest that so many students have in this topic of today's talk and the fact that they found a person who could respond to their queries. But the clock goes ticking and this wonderful session also has to come to an end. However, I'm very optimistic that Justice Hedigan, you will oblige us by coming back to speak to our students and give us the opportunity to gain from your wisdom and experience. As we come to the end of this session, I have the privilege to thank everyone who has contributed to the success of this lecture. We're extremely grateful to you, Justice Hedigan, for accepting our invitation to address the audience through the online platform and connect to the young minds at Symbiosis Law School, Pune. Thank you, sir, for talking to our students, and I'm sure they go back enriched, and I'm also sure that you have kindled a light in the minds of many here. The COVID pandemic has created a havoc. But at the same time, it has taught all of us that although movements have come to an uh, come to a near stop, we can still get connected. And in the world of technology, it has provided a means of being anywhere across the globe and be connected to people from any part of the world. We look forward to hearing you many, many more times. And we also look forward to hosting you again at Symbiosis Law School Pune once the pandemic is over. I also That's take your... Thank you, sir. And I also take this opportunity to place on record that we are happy to collaborate with IALS to host this IALS Distinguished Guest Speaker Program, and we are definitely uh, benefiting and gaining a lot from this collaboration. 
a very big thank you to Dr. Gurpur for the wonderful leadership that she provides to Symbiosis Law School Pune and ensures that the best is brought to the law school. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for all this. The International Cell at Symbiosis Law School Pune, along with Skalsar, requires a special mention. And I also thank you very much, Professor Raj, for moderating the question answer session today. Our IT team deserves a special mention for all the technical support that they have provided. And last but most important in any event is the audience. We have had more than 350 members in the audience today, and I must thank each one of you amongst the audience for joining us and encouraging us by your presence and questions and giving us that encouragement to organize more such event. Thank you. Thank you one and all. And thank you very much, Justice Hedigan, once again. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you.